Put your hand up if you've ever heard of the internet. All of you? Good, means I'm in the right room. Not gonna make that mistake again. Put your hand up if you have a Facebook account. Most of you, all right. And finally, put your hand up if you've ever liked, shared, retweeted, or hashtagged anything online. Okay, for those of you wondering who I am and why I'm asking you all of these questions, my name's Nicole and I'm just a normal social media user, like the rest of you. I'm in year 11 at Sydney Girls High School at the moment, and yes, before you say it, I do have a lot of badges on my blazer. But what I'm here to talk to you about today is slacktivism, and the, the aura around the word and the stigma that's associated with it, which I'll get to a little bit later. But more, more relevantly, the practice of using social media as a tool to, de to develop connections with charitable organisations and to advance and further your cause for reform. So first things first, could anyone tell me what the social web actually looked like in 2016? Would anyone like to take a guess at how many active users were on the internet? That's a lot of hands I see. Yes. Yeah, that's actually right. So there, there were over Good, great guessing. Um, there are actually over 3 billion active users on the internet at the moment, 1 billion of which are on Facebook, and at any given time, over 47% of internet traffic is directed to Facebook servers. Instagram has over 280 million users, of which all of them post content up to 70 million videos per day. Twitter has the same, also 200 million, 280 million users, as a very... Uh, interchangeable platforms. So why am I telling you about all of these things? Well, that's because I wanted to address the people who call our generation slacktivists. Usually these people will come from older generations and they'll misunderstand or mistake our self-aware or narcissistic generation where, with our armchair activists who don't do anything for social reform or change and rather would prefer to sit behind their computer screen and simply like Beyond Blue on Facebook instead of take part in one of their charity events. So, do their claims have any merit? Does slacktivism really allow us to be lazy and for our action to be ineffectual? Let me give you five reasons why the answer to both of those questions is no. So the first of these, awareness. Last year, a phenomenon known as the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge swept the internet, and users, myself included, drenched themselves in icy cold water and nominated others to do the same. But even though all the focus of that challenge was on how persuasively you can get your friends to dump a bucket of ice on their head and how good you can look on camera while you're doing it or how loudly you can scream at the ice cubes flowing down your back, that campaign raised over $100 million for the ALS Foundation, which is an incredible amount given that all these people were doing was sitting behind their computer screens and pouring cold water over their heads. That's incredible. Or even, does anybody remember that Coney 2012 video from four years ago? Yeah, it's almost five years ago now that that was released. But according to a 2014 Financial Times article by Matthew Green, that video, with its 30 minutes of cinematography, achieved more than battalions of diplomats, NGO workers, and politicians combined since the, the, since the conflict began over 20 years ago. That video has now over 101 million views on YouTube and means that the slacktivists that created it and that were behind it and encouraged the campaign on Facebook, Twitter and other social media networks were, were hugely successful. And for a current example, the Black Lives Matter movement in America with the riots in Ferguson, Missouri that exemplified the underlying racial prejudices where an unarmed African-American teenager was shot dead by a police officer. This drew attention to the disproportionate number of African-American people due, who were being prosecuted for uh, instances that were outside of their control and really brought attention to the underlying issues uh, with race politics in the United States. But Nicole, I hear you cry out from the audience, why is awareness such a good thing? Uh, well, for one, more awareness of the fight for equal rights for women, Aboriginal people, the LGBTQ community, and other otherwise ignored minorities allow, does not allow governments and companies to infringe upon those rights and rather 
makes it a leading catalyst in legislative reform. So then, to the second reason, community. Earlier this year, I attended a youth parliament program with Mason here and another girl who's in uh, the room back there. Basically, this camp allowed me to associate with a bunch of like-minded and politically forward individuals like myself and Mason here. This meant that I was afforded an opportunity to take part in a supportive and like-minded community that I didn't realize that other people didn't have the opportunity to attend. After attending the program, it really made me think about people who weren't able to access those programs, either because of their social isolation or because of their physical isolation and geographically where they lived. It made me think about how privileged I was to attempt uh, to attend those programs. But the thing is, is that I didn't have to attend a real life program to get that community behind me. Because the thing was, is that I could have gotten that community online, like lots of other people do. And that's where social media steps in. There are two main types of community that are especially supportive and are very, very impactful. The first of these are personally supportive communities. A really important uh, use of this is YouTube, where people will share their personal stories for likes and comments and shares. And even though it might seem narcissistic to put yourself out online speaking about your troubles or your domestic violence experiences, it's incredibly impactful on people who are going through the same circumstances and have understood the same issues and struggles that they can identify with. This means that people, say my friend, let's call her um, Melinda, was going through depression and she lived out in Lismore, so she didn't get access to the services that were afforded in Metro Sydney, which is where I live. And so instead of searching for those services in her area, she was able to go online and contact a representative from beyond blue through Facebook. And that allowed her to alleviate her depression and those depressive circumstances that, that surrounded her and her life and allowed her to ease her way out of that depression. And now she's, she's way clear. The second types of these communities are like-minded, motivated communities. I myself am in a few of these. But to give you an example, people who really like the environment could have their own group on Facebook, could go out and advocate for events uh, in real life. People who live in the country, such as Melinda, who I mentioned lived in Lismore, can find a community that they may not be able to reach themselves. And even people who are in their senior years of high school like me. Yes, even we have our own discussion page on Facebook. These communities allow people in remote areas, people with uh, social anxiety, or people who don't find themselves involved with a lot of activities to be introduced to others. And that's so incredibly powerful. And even though that might be considered as slacktivism, it's really not, because it allows people to unify under one label or one term. And that makes you feel like you belong. So the third reason then, and that's capital. When you liked that page on Facebook, you added populace to that charity and you granted it political capital. For example, if I started a charity today, I myself probably wouldn't be able to lobby the government for the reforms I wanted effectively because there was only one of me. But if I had a thousand people who supported me, I'd probably be able to, to reach a lot more and go a lot further in the bargaining process. And it's simple maths when you think about it. 1,000 is more than one, or at least that's what Extension 1 Maths told me. That means that to some extent, you have a say in what charities are able to do, and you're allowed to mould their way of thinking into yours. For example, when you like a page, like uh, Beyond Blue, for example, which has over 500,000 likes on Facebook, you not only expose yourself to their events, which you're more than welcome to attend, but you also have more power when it comes to reform in terms of the reform that they do when they ask you for your opinion. That means that your like is able to go a long way, really, in achieving your purposes. And you know what the cool part is? It works the other way around, too. When you're organizing your event, you're able to give it a lot more legitimacy, such as the TEDx youth event here today, by using the TED name. This means that you're able to give yourself a lot more credit and get a lot more people interested in the event than you otherwise would if you started it without any associations. Change.org petitions are a really great example of this. I've seen hundreds or even thousands of signatures on petitions that friends of mine have started that we would never have expected from just random strangers who've seen that link on Facebook or wherever she's posted it. 
last year in the same youth parliament program that I was talking about earlier, one of our friends did a petition about domestic violence and that got hundreds if not thousands of signatures and ended up in front of state parliament. These petitions alone are able to overturn government decisions and are able to lobby companies into understanding what people want. And a really good example here is animal testing. There are really big organisations on Facebook and otherwise online who campaign and lobby for, to bring an end to animal, animal testing. And a lot of companies have listened. And while some have some way to go, they're still working on it at the moment. So fourth, discourse. Who here has seen Donald Trump memes on Facebook? Most of you. Well, those and the comments following are a form of political discourse where individuals are able to voice their views on a unique and challenging platform. One of the key parts of social media is that all views and opinions are open to be challenged and scrutinised. But how does that relate to me? Well, I have a lot of opinions as someone who attends a youth parliament program, and I was surprised with the backlash that I got on a Melbourne Cup post last year, where I said that I just really liked the Melbourne Cup and really enjoyed watching it. I'd never even thought about the animal cruelty that could be associated with the industry, and it really opened my eyes to a new avenue of thinking, and I'm definitely much more open to have that discussion today than to when I first started posting my opinions online about a year or two ago. And that's really healthy for the advancement of new ideas. A good example of this as well is Nicole Arbour's Dear Fat People video, whereby body positive activists highlighted that the best body size or the perfect body size is whatever makes you the most comfortable. This, and pardon the pun that I'm about to say, allows for a survival of the fittest of ideas and means that only the best ideas will progress and graduate from our community to lead to its ongoing prosperity and it means that it can have a lot of influence in our personal views, and I know that it has in my personal views. So fifth, which is action. The most beautiful part of what you do on the internet is that it never occurs in isolation. There's always an aspect to be transformed or transferred into real life activities, and there's always a way to back up your like, your share, or your hashtag online. For me, when I like something on Facebook, I often go to the events that are liked by that page or linked by that page. I went from a keyboard warrior to a real life activist because I was able to find causes that I was genuinely passionate about through social media and the organisations that it is able to link me to, such as homelessness and mental health that I've actually been out to campaign for. And I'm, I'm really happy that I have because I've been able to make an impactful change in the lives of the people who are affected by those issues. And don't just take my word for it either because I'm hardly a credible source. But statisticians at Yale University found that the people who frequently engaged in promotional social activity, such as liking, tweeting, hashtagging, sharing, whatever, were twice as likely as non-social media promoters to donate to charity, twice as likely to volunteer their time, twice as likely to take part in charitable events, three times as likely to solicit donations on behalf of their cause, and more than four times as likely to encourage political representatives to sign a petition or to take action. The five reasons I've spoken about today make the internet so powerful and its role so incredibly important. But at the end of that all, you might be thinking, but Nicole, what does my like, share or hashtag really mean? And here's the thing, it can mean whatever you want it to. To me, it means so much more than a simple nonsensical virtual approval system. To me, it opens doors for future opportunities. But at the very least for you, next time you like something, next time you, you share, and next time somebody bags you out for being a slacktivist who only likes pages on Facebook but doesn't do anything in real life, tell them that they're wasting their breath because you have done more for social justice causes than they ever have for bagging you out for it. Thank you.